And faith can move mountains. Ah. You want to move mountains? Faith can move mountains. You know, God loves us so much. God loves you so much. Not because we are lovely people, you know. <laughs> it's easy to love lovely people, you know. Isn't it? All right? Very easy. Lovely people, we love them so easily. But God loves you and me so much. It's because He's love. So you come to church. You come to church is to worship Him. You come to church is because you want to learn His word. Because the Bible says that men shall not live by bread alone. Men shall not live by bakute alone. But by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. All right? So that's why you come to church. You come to church because you want to learn His word. So as you learn His word, faith arises in you. And when faith arises in you, you are able to overcome all the difficulties and tribulation of this world. We are living in dark days now, you know. Do you know we are living in dark days? War is looming. Already there is war. And lots of rumors of war, the Bible says, in the last days. Earthquakes are, uh, you know, the measure of earthquakes are getting um, more and more, you know. The number of earthquakes getting more and more. Famine, everything. We are living in dark days. But praise be the Lord Jesus because we are more than conquerors to them who love him. Amen? Amen. All right? So God loves us not because we are so lovely or we come to church every day or every Sunday. Doesn't mean you come to church more and God loves you more or come to church less and God loves you less. You come to church because you want to worship him and you want to learn his word. Learn his words, all right? Faith comes from hearing and hearing from the word of Christ. Whether you come to church more or you come to church less, God is love. His love for you is immeasurable. The Bible says that you may know the highs and the depths from the east to the west, how far is love, how deep is his love for you and me. Amen? And God... God has uh, demonstrated His love to us 2,000 years ago by sending His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. Independent of whether you believe Him or not. You know, we, are, we haven't even existed yet. Everyone, anyone of you existed when Jesus died on the cross? Any forefathers of yours existed when Jesus died on the cross? Any one of you got relatives in Jerusalem that them 2,000 years ago? None, okay? None. All right? Independent of whether you have existed or you haven't existed, independent of whether you believe in him or you haven't believed in him, that was 2,000 years ago and Jesus died on the cross for you and me as a sacrifice to God the Father so that all our sins will be forgiven and be forgotten. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's uh, bow our heads and close our eyes and commit this time to the Lord. Father in heaven, I want to thank you for your abundant love, your bounding grace upon us. Even as I share your word, I pray for your anointing on my worker cords. I pray for revelation and knowledge to be amongst each and every one of us that we will receive your word and we will know your word. And when we know your word, we will be stronger and stronger in our faith, in trusting in you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I rebuke every foul spirit from the devil, demonic spirits. I take authority over you, satanic forces. I rebuke you and I cast you out right now, out from this place, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Give you all the glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Let's go to our first verse. All right. Today's message is about faith in the finished work. All right. The finished work of our Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah? Not, when people tell you, hey, you finished, la. you know what it means, right? right? That you are finished. All right. 
But Jesus, when he died on the cross, one of his, his final words before he gave up his ghost was, it is finished. Let's go to the book of John 19. John 19. Is there? John 19, verse 28. Okay, I'll read it out. Just recap. Two weeks ago, I shared about this. After this, John 19, verse 28. After this, Jesus knowing that all things were now accomplished. This is about Jesus on the cross. That the scripture might be fulfilled. Say it, I thirst. All right? Jesus said, I thirst. All right? He was thirsty. Why he was thirsty? Because all the works that he, he was supposed to do, it was done. Jesus was born through Mary. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Imagine was a virgin. But Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit. There was a, con there was a conception in Mary. So Jesus was born without sin. He knew no sin and he did no sin, all right? After Jesus was born, Mary had a normal life, all right? She was no longer a virgin. So stop praying to this Virgin Mary, <laughs> okay? She had a few more children. She had sons and daughters, a normal life. But when she gave to Jesus, she was a virgin, conceived by the Holy Spirit, all right? First Adam, God created Adam from dust. Jesus is also known as the second Adam, conceived by the Holy Spirit. So he was born on earth for a purpose, a mission. For God so loved the world. The world means every race, right? Some of my gay friends, I tell you, for God so loved the world, even you, whatever, whatever gender you are, right? <laughs> that whosoever, whosoever that believe in him will not perish, will not die, but have eternal life. Eternal life, all right? So after Mary gave birth to Jesus, like I say, her husband was Joseph. They had, they had a family. They had many other children, okay? So Jesus, when he was about 33 years old, he was crucified on the cross. In Isaiah 53, it says that he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for iniquities because God is a just God. For God to forgive our sins, He cannot just forgive you just like that. There must be a sacrifice of blood. Our brother, Pastor Jack, has been sharing just now about the Levitical priesthood. Sacrifice year after year. But God has a plan for mankind once and for all. Once and for all. All sins of the world will be forgiven, will be abolish this system of forgiveness year by year by the sacrificial lamb. That is through Jesus Christ. That is through Jesus Christ, the sins of 2,000 years ago and sins of today and the sins of the future. The sins of tomorrow, right? If any of your relatives, like I've said many times, any of your friends believe in Jesus five minutes from now, that is sin of the future is being forgiven. Isn't it? Right? So Jesus, when he was on the cross, he said it is accomplished. When Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. It is finished. Past ten. It is finished. It's not finishing. Huh? It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his ghost. His ghost means his spirit. So what is finished? Condemnation he took upon himself. Sins of the world he took upon himself. Sickness and diseases he took upon himself. Sickness of 2,000 years ago and now and the future. Whatever viruses you may have, he took upon himself. That was 2,000 years ago. He took upon himself. And he also took upon himself poverty. Poverty. You understand? Poverty is mean lack. Not enough, not enough food, not enough provision, not enough money, in other words. All right? He took upon himself. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. All right? Anyone can read? 
from the King James Version? Any volunteers? This was very important, huh? Because when you read it, it will give you a revelation of how to get out of poverty. Any volunteer? You can take up. You can use your Bible app if you want to, but put to flight mode, huh? Second Corinthians chapter eight verse nine. Memorize these words, meditate on it. The Bible says in Psalm chapter one that meditate upon His word day and night. Ah, oh, Sister Grace, can you read aloud? You may want to stand up to read. Exactly. Amen. Thank you, sister. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he was rich. And for your sake, he became poor. That you, through his poverty, might become rich. Then you ask the question, how come I'm not rich? <laughs> that is why the word there say, might become rich. Might, may, must, will. Okay, uh, let me just teach you a little English, all right? May means very high possibility. He may come to my house tonight. I mean, very high possibility, all right? Okay. And then somebody say, he will come to my house tonight. That means 100% uh, he will. Uh, unless the flip phone fake never come, uh, I cannot do anything. Uh, okay? <laughs> okay. He will come to my house tonight. But he might come to my house. That means there is a possibility, but the possibility actually is slimmer. That is why the church today, a lot of uh, people are lacking and provisional lacking. Poverty means poorness is there. But Jesus on the cross 2,000 years ago, through his poverty, you might become rich. All right, why? Are we not rich? And why are we not? We don't have this divine health. Why are we uh, finding trouble to overcome mountains or difficulties? There's a reason to it, all right? And it's not God's plan for you. Because Jesus on the cross, on that finished work, He's already done it. He already done it. Let's go to a, a verse in Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 24. Let's see how the Lord work His plan out, all right? Deuteronomy 2.24, this word was given to Moses. He said, rise ye up. Take your journey. Uh, this is when they have came up from, the, from Egypt. The children of Israel, like they came up from Egypt. They were in slavery for, I think, 600 years, if I'm not mistaken. Or 400 years. They were in slavery, right? For us, if you are a slave for even one day or so, you, 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 got, <laughs> you, know, you already have trauma. The whole generations and for, for, for 400 years, if not mistaken. 400 years of slavery in Egypt. And God brought them up from Egypt, from, from slavery. Past the Red Sea. Because God told them, there is a promised land I'm going to give you. A land of milk and honey. Milk and honey means milk, all right? Not, not, not that the land, a lot of milk flowing in, all right? There's a lot of cattle there, all right? You, you, uh, milk doesn't come from the ground. I'm sure you know, right? Where milk comes from. <laughs> so cattle were, were breeding there. Easily, sheep, goats, cows, any kind of cattle. Milk and honey. Honey means easy to plant. Plant uh, vegetation, <coughs> weeds, and all sort of uh, plantation. All right. When you see a lot, of, you can see a lot of bees are buzzing around. It means it's a it's a it's a fertile soil. A soil which is fertile. So 
God spoke to Moses, rise ye up, take your journey. Past the river Arnon, behold, I have given to your hand Sihon, the Amorite king of Heshbon, and his land. Begin to possess it and contend with him in battle. That's the reason why it might come, might become rich. The possibility is there. But you have to go and possess it. You don't sit and on your chair and do nothing and expect money to fall from heaven. God don't print money in heaven. Right? Otherwise, it would be counterfeit. You know what's counterfeit? God is not in the business of counterfeiting. Yeah? The Bible says, If any will be given unto you, press down, shaken. Men shall give unto your bosom. People, all right? People. Right? But you have to go and possess that land. You have to rise up. My friends, you have to rise up. All right? Rise up doesn't mean rise, wake up from your bed. All right? Every day you wake up from your bed. Rise up means you must stand up in battle against the enemies. Possess it. Contain him in battle because we have an enemy. And the name, our enemy name is Satan. And the biggest lie of Satan is he don't exist. That's why nobody even bothered to talk about him. But he's behind all, 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 all the troubles in the world, all the darkness in the world. The Bible says we, we, we wish not with flesh and blood. We wage not with flesh and blood, but we fight against principalities of darkness, high places, evil forces. And you have to do your battle every day. You have to resist the devil, the Bible says. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. All right. You do the resisting. God is not going to resist for you. You do the resisting, and he has given you the power to do the resisting. He has given you all authorities. That's why you resist the devil in the name of Jesus Christ. Because you are born again. When you're born again, your spirit is born in you. The Holy Spirit lives in you. So when you resist the devil in the name of Jesus, you can, he will flee from you, right? He will run away from you. So every, anytime when you face difficulties and something inside of you say the devil is oppressing you, you tell the devil to get lost. In the name of Jesus, resist him. And he will run away from you. In other words, he will not disturb you anymore. But the problem is the following day, another, another bunch of demons will come. And you resist him also. And maybe in another day, another bunch of demons will come. You resist him also. And the day will come, they dare not come near you anymore. Because every time they come near you, they got to run. Not run in one direction, run in seven directions. That's how powerful you are. All right? I know we may come from very, uh, some of you may come from difficult background and going through a lot of uh, difficult difficulties in whatever situation you are. You think it's a big deal. Yes, it's a big deal. But we have a God who is a bigger deal. Bigger deal, understand? And when you and God, when you are together, you are already a majority. You are already a majority. You and God. The Bible says that he who is in you is greater than Satan who is in the world. There are more with you than those outside there against you. So many Bible verses and promises. Use it and resist the devil. All right? So possess the land. You got to do the possessing, all right? Imagine I give you a, you have a new uh, new condominium somewhere in in the city center. You got a title is there is under your name. But you need to go and 
possess it. You know, that's why in uh, real estate they call it what? Possessing. Is, it, is that what they call? Yeah. They pass you the keys, you can go and possess your house. Was that? Was that? No, possession. You need to go and possess it. All right. Likewise, God has given you the promised land on the finished work of our Jesus Christ. You don't need to scream and shout. You need to possess it. And there are many ways to possess it, all right? One of the ways is to rise you up, stand up and rise up, go ahead, have a vision to possess it. Now, I've been a Christian. I accepted the law when I was almost 13 years old. That was many, many years ago, decades ago, all right? And of course, my early days, the teaching are a bit different from nowadays. And, and a lot of promises in the Bible. Uh, those days, the church, uh, although it's charismatic, we have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you have this, we have that. But there's not much teaching on grace and faith. Grace means the unmerited favor, unearned favor, which God has given to you and God has done it. For you, all right? That's grace, all right? Grace is God's part. Always remember that. Grace is God's part. It's not your part. It's God's part, all right? But I find my life has not been very victorious. A lot up and down for decades. So somewhere in 21-7, I have a huge financial distress, all right? Huge financial distress. And I was searching how to possess the promised land. How to possess the promised land. Because God promised us, through all the scripture, I was like the, the Israelites in the wilderness. They were wandering for 40 years before they went into the promised land. Full of unbelief, although they have seen the miracles of God. So I started to do some research. Of course, you go to YouTube channel. One of the first speakers I, I remember listening to, although he had passed away, he is a South African preacher. He's a, a South African doesn't mean he's a, he's a black, he's a white a South African. He a, has a very unique name called Cobus Van Resber or something like that, right? He's, anyway, he died already, he passed away, been a lot. And his teachings are not too bad, you know, about, about uh, faith and possession. And, and, and then I stumble on one speaker called Bill, Bill Winston, you know, Bill Winston. So when you Google how to possess the land, the promised land, you know, there are a lot of teaching. You got to spend time, you know. So I do a lot, do a lot of research, do a lot of reading and do a lot of understanding how to possess the promised land. And I realize in the scripture, uh, the promised land, although it's promised for you, you know, but it doesn't fall on your lap. You have to go and possess it. And while in possession, while in possession, there are battles to be fought. Do you know that promised land was promised to Abraham hundreds of years ago? The promised land. But it took them so long to arrive in the promised land. And even when the promised land were nearby after they crossed the, the Red Sea, they still haven't possessed it. And because the land, which is a land which is fertile, a land of milk and honey, throughout that few hundreds of years, that land have squatters. You know what I mean? Have squatters, all right? If you have about uh, 20 acres of land somewhere in Shalam or in or in Pataling Jaya, and you do nothing, you don't barricade it, you leave it by itself. Uh, don't talk about PJ or, or, or Shalam or Klang. Maybe it's, maybe some, some further places, all right? Maybe in Pahang State or whatever. You may have 20 acres of land, okay? Good land, all right? Not far from the highway. And if you leave it for 20 years, the next 20 years you go there, you'll be shocked, you know. You'll find a lot of people staying there already. <laughs> people build houses, wooden houses. People planting uh, uh, durians. Suddenly uh, your 20 acres of land is filled with people. Maybe immigrants, illegals. 
So that's, that is the same thing. This promised land, which was given for them, and for a few hundred years, nobody sat on it, and yeah, they have all these other people there. And that's why God said to them, go and kick them out. The Amalekites, Hittites, Kites, I don't know what other eyes. <laughs> you know. So let's go to the next verse. In Proverbs 23. Now, it's very important that you need to prom possess that land. You know. Possess that dream of yours. Possess that, that, that thing that you want, that you need. Right? Whether it's healing, whether it is financial prosperity, or whether it is soul prosperity, you know, even as your soul prosper, you know. Third John, chapter one. Anyway, Third John only got one chapter, right? Like. Beloved, I wish above all things that you may prosper, even your health, as your soul prosper, you know. You, as your soul prosper. You may have all the money in the world. You may have all the divine health you have. But you need to be happy. You need to have joy. That's why there's three things. Good health. Financial prosperity. And soul prosperity. Soul is where your mind is. Your emotions are. Imagine you have all the money and always depressed and angry. No so prosperity, not happy every time. Very unhappy. I got millions in a bank. What a stupid fella. <laughs> you know. And not healthy. Always got sickness. They need to take lots of medication. God's plan for us is that you will have the wine health, you have financial prosperity, even as your soul prosper. In other words, you are a happy fella. Joyful, inexplicable joy, peaceful, you know. Now, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. You see, thinking, imagination, what you see inside of you is very important. If you think you're a failure, you are a failure. If you imagine you are always poor and broke, then you will be. If you think you are always sick and always wanting to die and unhealthy, you will be sooner or later. All right? As a man thinks in his heart, his heart is where the mind is, the emotions are, the will is, so is he. Now in Galatians chapter 3, let's go through this verse, all right? Just now I'll talk about Mike. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. This is what Jesus has done on the cross 2,000 years ago. The finished work, he took all the curses. If you read the curses in the book of Deuteronomy 28, you will find it's so lengthy, so lengthy. When you read also, you get frightened, you know. Really get frightened. Try reading it. All the curse of the law is really bad. And one of the last curse in Deuteronomy 28 is you be made a slave. And when you make a slave, they put you in the marketplace and nobody want to buy you also. That bad. <laughs> really pathetic. You know? So Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law being a curse for us. And how he became a curse for us? On the cross. That's why he said it is finished. For, for three hours, he took all the sins of the world, the curses, the sickness, the poverty, the condemnation, the guilt, Anything, everything that is bad for us, he took it upon himself. For it is written, curse is everyone that hang on a tree. Now this is the curse in the book of Deuteronomy. Crucifixion wasn't even invented then. 
that the blessing of Abraham, now, again, all right, I've searched, I've done a lot of research on this verse, verse 14, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentile through Jesus Christ. Again, it's might. Might means there is a possibility that he will come. There is also a possibility that he will not come. So therefore, you have to go and possess the land. Rise up. You tell me 2.24 just now. Rise ye up. Go into battle. Possess the land. So if you need to possess this land so that the blessing of Abraham might come unto you, there is a way. And God has provided us a way. And that way is true faith. Faith is able to make you, to cause the blessing of Abraham to come upon you. All right? Faith. And faith is such a big subject that I can go on and teaching and teaching. Might come unto the Gentile. All right? And you must start professing and confessing that this Abraham of this blessing of Abraham will come unto you. Will come unto you. Now, what is the blessing of Abraham? Abraham, you know, God loves us so much, and he knows all our weaknesses. And he has anticipated whatever troubles you will face, even today. Whatever trouble you are facing today, he already anticipated it. Before the foundation of the world, he already. And he has already provided a solution for you. And that solution, you have to appropriate faith and put your trust in him so that the solution will come into pass. Now, this blessing of Abraham. Everybody say, blessing of Abraham. Louder, blessing of Abraham. Will come unto me. Yeah. Will manifest. In my life. In Romans chapter 3, verse 22, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ. Now, Romans 3, verse 22, there are many translations. Right? A lot of modern translation talks about the righteousness of God, which is by faith in Jesus Christ. But if you look at the King James Version and some other older version, I did some research, there are some Aramaic Bible verses or lit Young's Literal Translation, you will find that the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, there's a difference between faith in Jesus Christ or faith of Jesus Christ. Faith in Jesus Christ means you need to put your faith in Him. But faith of Jesus Christ means this faith belongs to Him and He gives it to you. And this is in line with Ephesians 2 verse 8. Do we have Ephesians 2 verse 8? For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourself. Not your goodness, not your, your ability, not your credential, not your smartness, not your discipline, not your goody-goody, all right? You are saved by grace. Grace is God's part. True faith. And this faith is also God's part because he has given you the faith of Jesus Christ. That's why in Galatians 2 verse 20, 2 verse 20 I have been crucified with Christ. 221. Yet not I, but Christ who lives in me. The life that I live in this flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Book of Romans say, everyone is given the measure of faith. You are given the measure of faith. A faith a 12 year old boy has. Or a 20-year-old girl has. Or a 50-year-old years, years old man have. They are the same. They are the same. 
You know why? Because it's not your faith. It is the faith of the Son of God. And you have that complete faith in you already. That faith which is perfect was given to you. You say by grace, through faith, and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God. When God gives you something, He doesn't give you something which is inferior. He gives you something which is perfect. And that perfect faith of the Son of God, you already have it. All right. The other day I was listening to my phone. Music, you know, earpiece on, from my phone. All right? And I was holding it, putting it in my pocket. Listening to some music, walking in my garden, enjoying the music and meditating on some of God's word. Walking inside the house. Then suddenly I realized I need to make a phone call. <laughs> and I was looking for my phone. I went to my room, tried to look for my phone. Went downstairs, tried to look for my phone. All the while, the phone is in my pocket, but I was listening to music on my phone. And after a while, it got a little bit uh, anxious. Where is my phone? <laughs> Did I left in the car or somewhere else or in the restaurant? I was there earlier. But the phone was with me all the while. And then only later I realized, hey, my phone is here. <laughs> you already have it. That faith. That faith, that finished work on the cross 2,000 years ago, Jesus has already done it for you. So stop begging. Stop begging. Time to possess your land. Possess your land, you will. And you have to possess the land in many ways. Speaking, confessing his word. Because we are being bombarded by all, a lot of messages in the world, negative messages, right? A lot of negative messages. Every day. So be careful what kind of uh, news you read every day. Right? Faith comes from hearing and hearing from the word of Christ. Not from some ABC news or CNN news or whatever news you read to or Malaysia Kini. You know, don't, don't read too much Malaysia Kini and it's funny found that, oh, you think faith can arise? Too much negative news in the world because negative news can sell. Good news people don't want to, not interested to read. But if you spend more time with the word of God, you'll find your faith, quote unquote, arise. Actually, that faith has been always been there. It is less of your flesh, more of the word. That's all. Sometimes you think you fast and pray. Oh, I've been fasting, Lord. Uh, you know, you think you want to move God by fasting. You think God will be moved. God is impressed. Oh, you, you terrible, are like you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I fast many times before. And then I quit. Because the thing that I'm fasting and the thing that I'm praying, it didn't happen. <laughs> I quit. You know? God is not moved by all your so called quote unquote fasting, prayer. Uh, some of these may shock you also. Prayer. You know, like, like the Pharisees, the book of Matthew. Repetitive prayers, they pray and pray and pray. Everybody can hear. You know, we have a lot of this kind of stuff in the church today, you know. Eloquent prayer. Yeah. Not even adding any ounce of faith to it, you know. You know, there are very positive words and quotes like, you know, prayer can move mountains. It's not scripture at all. There's no words in the Bible that say that prayer can move mountains. Mark eleven twenty two have faith in God. Twenty three say unto the mountains, be uprooted. In other words, have faith in God. Use faith to move mountains. You say to the mountains. Faith is the positive response from us. 
to what God has already done it by grace. If God hasn't done it by grace 2,000 years ago, that finished work of Jesus Christ, if it has not been done, nothing can work. It is because it has been done, the finished work, now you're appropriating faith, this positive response to what Jesus has done on the cross 2,000 years ago. That finished work. So when you have faith in the finished work, you're appropriating your faith, the faith of the Son of God, which is in you. You have this positive response to what God has done on the cross by grace. Amen. Amen. We want to move God, yay. God didn't want me to be moved. He was moved by Jesus 2,000 years ago on the cross. He was moved. And that's it. God is not stopped. You don't need to move him, all right? God is not lacking. You don't need to move him. God is not sick or tired. You don't need to move him. We are the one that is stuck. Sometimes people say, oh, I found God. As if God is lost. We are the one that is lost. God found us. So you are saved by grace. And grace is, grace is God's part. Grace is God's provision. That's why I'm, my grace is sufficient for you. Why? Sufficient means supply. And faith also given by God. That faith of the Son of God, God's faith, which is a gift, and that not of yourself, not, not of your goodness, is be, if it's because of goodness, it will not be good enough. If it's because of righteousness, it will not be righteous enough. If grace is by works and not a gift, then grace will not be grace anymore. Then you're back to the law of Moses. You think you can attain righteousness from the law? Can you? Then Jesus would have died in vain. Jesus would have died in vain on the cross. Suffered for what? For nothing. By his stripes you are healed. By his wounds you are healed. All the scourging. Isaiah 52, he has, he has no visage. Face was marred. You can't recognize him. You can't res recognize him. People do not esteem him anymore. He was beaten so badly. He was bruised so badly. All this would have been in vain if you believe that your righteousness comes from the law, Moses and the prophets. So that is a trick of the devil. To deceive you that righteousness can come from the law. Do you know in the book of Revelation, when Satan will be bound into the bottomless pit, the book of Revelation say that he deceived the nations no more. Satan, greatest power is deception. And you and I have more power than him. He only lies and lies and deceives and deceives you. And one of the biggest things he wants to deceive you is that you, that you are a failure, God don't love you, you're not good enough, condemnation. And because you're not righteous enough, that's why you cannot have your healing. Because you didn't do enough, that's why you are poor. Because you haven't come to church. That's why you're in trouble. Because you're not giving accordingly the 10%, the tithes. That's why you are poor. This curse of the law, including the curse of tithes, He has redeemed you. From the book of Malachi, right? I know a lot of Christian leaders like to use that. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't give. We give because we know He's going to bless us in return. 
Give and it shall be given unto you. We give because we give cheerfully. That's why Paul say, give cheerfully. Because when you give cheerfully, you know you're giving to the kingdom of God and God will bless you a hundredfold. But if you give under compulsion, according to the law of 10%, which is tithes, you are in trouble. You have fallen from grace. There is a difference. Can you see the difference? Giving under compulsion according to the law and giving cheerfully your 10% or 20% or your 1% or 0.1% or 0.001%. Or 0 Why so quiet? Talk about money only, everybody. <laughs> Talk about 10%, everybody like, ah. Whether you give 10 or 100 or 0 0.1 or 0 0.00 or don't give at all, you are you're still righteous, okay? And God still loves you. God still loves you, all right? Just that there are laws in the Bible and principles that the law of giving and receiving. All right? This is another message by itself. So you are saved by grace and this faith is in you and you got to use this faith. Let's go quickly in Proverbs 29. How can you use this faith? You see, where there's no vision, the word vision is also an image. The people perish. The word vision is also imagination. So it's very important to use imagination because imagination is part of the faith teaching. The faith that is in you. You know, we are so good in negative imagination. Huh? Negative imagination, very simple. You know, you get a report from the, the, the doctor, a report that you have some you know, tumors or maybe have a, some sort of very negative report that you know, you're suffering from this particular disease, that disease. And suddenly you have this imagination that you're going to die. You maybe start imagining your funeral also. And what song you want to sing in your funeral? And who's attending your funeral? You have all this imagination already. So quickly. You haven't died yet, also, you start imagining. And then maybe you start singing the song Amazing Grace, right? And who is attending? Imagine yourself in the coffin. You see? And if you're the kind of guy who go and wash your car and, 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 and things to yourself, it's going to rain afterwards. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. We have this negative imagination so easily. Picture of ourselves as failure. Picture of ourselves as sick. The Bible says in Hebrews 11 verse 1, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. You have to start seeing yourself first. You have start seeing yourself inside. You start seeing yourself as strong and healthy. You have start seeing yourself as rich and prosperous. You have start to see yourself as happy before it can even manifest outside. If you see yourself inside as a failure, as a sicko, and a cheapo, you will manifest outside, right? <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> Start seeing yourself, the image yourself. Faith is a substance of things hoped for. Where there is no vision, the people perish. What vision is, is the Bible talking about? Revelational, revelational, revelational uh, 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 knowledge, vision, image, imagination, conception. In fact, the word vision comes from a Hebrew word called yetzer, Y-E-T-S-E-R. The word vision, the word imagination, the word conception all come from this same word. And these words means is conception, imagination, vision, image. You got to have that image of yourself as inside of you. And God have given you that faith of God. And that faith of God is huge. Now faith is a substance of things hoped for, hope. 
a confident of expectation of something that is going to happen in the future, not occur yet, haven't happened yet. But you can already can see inside of you, in your mind, that is going to happen. The imagination. Last couple of months, I've started to imagine a lot of things. Yeah. You know, uh, many of you know that uh, I'm in this business of uh, go and copper mine, where the asset is in, in uh, Mongolia. So I've been very uh, silly for many years. You know, every time I ask the Lord to for for certain provision, let's say I need five hundred thousand. I'll pray for the 500,000. Then after that, 200,000. Sometimes I need 1 million. After that, 2 million. Sometimes 3 million. And there was an occasion somewhere in 21 night. I needed originally 4 million. And within 2 3 months, the money came. But every time I have this, 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 this habit of just asking, like, according to budget, you know, budget. <laughs> you know. The need for 4 million, the need for 500, the need for 200, the need for one, you know. And, and one fine day, as this couple of months, I realized I was limiting God. I was limiting Him. You know. And so now I begin to ask for bigger sum, not according to the budget. You know. Huge, 30, 40 million. And I began to have this imagination and seeing it. All right? And it's according to the word of God, scripturally, all right? Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Not seen doesn't mean not seen in the natural eye, but seen in the inner eye. Seen in your imagination. Now, if you look at Genesis 15, verse 5. In NLT version. Then the Lord took Abraham. Abraham was before his name was Abraham. Outside and said to him. Now see, you might understand where Abraham, Abraham is living, you know. He was staying inside the tent. Inside the tent. Now if God said to him inside the tent, look up. And then he'll look up and the tent is just the ceiling of the tent. What can he see? He can see nothing. Just a piece of cloth or whatever is hanging on the on the ceiling. But God took Abraham outside and said to him, Look up into the sky and count the stars if you can. And this is the night sky of the desert. Pitch dark, no pollution. No pollution at all in the sky. Nowadays, if you try to find one star, so difficult in the night in in Kiel, huh? full of clouds and pollution, I suppose. But in the desert, in the night sky, if you've seen some of those images, you will see thousands and thousands of millions and millions of stars. And God have to take Abraham outside from the tent so that he can see for himself. And count the stars if he can, he seeds his children. The seeds of Abraham. God has to give him an image and imagination. So he has this imagination all the time. And when God takes Abraham outside, that night is full of stars. It's not every night you can see all the stars in the desert. You know, in Mongolia, if it's on summer day and so on, when the when the when daylight is long can't see many stars and during the winter and so on or autumn to winter when the night is long nights you know like 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 10 p.m i mean like like 6 p 6 p.m really dark already, you know? yeah. long night you know, until next morning is still dark pitch dark you can see you look up the sky you have that imagination on yourself. You have the imagination on the vision. You have that imagination. You see yourself first. Why? Imagining now? Don't fall asleep. Huh? So shall your descendants will be. That many. That many. 
Let's go to Isaiah 26 3. Very quickly, I'm going to close. You will keep him in perfect peace. I mean, God, God will keep me in perfect peace. Whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Now, the mind is where the imagination is. We got to keep, we must have this imagination of your healing, of your prosperity. You must have this imagination of yourself. I know many of you come from different backgrounds. Many of you have been successful once before, and then how you fail, and then you never got up. That's why Deuteronomy 2 24, rise ye up. Many of you have been healthy once upon a time, and then you fell sick or something like that, and suddenly you are, you're discouraged. You're no longer the person you used to be. Rise ye up. The Lord will give you and keep you in perfect peace. All right, you have this perfect peace. Your soul is happy. You can sleep well. You're confident because your mind, your imagination. This word "mind" is from the Hebrew word "yetzer." Also, it stayed on him. All right, stayed on him. Very quickly, in other words, talking about limitation, God, limiting God. Psalms 78 How often did they provoke him in the wilderness And grieve him in the desert Now this is when they got up From slavery They got up They got out from slavery And now they are in the desert They are grieving him God has showed so many miracles Miracles after miracles they are, Many of them are idol worshippers But now they are out of slavery They got food They got manna they got water to drink. In verse 41, yeah, they turn back. They turn back. In other words, they don't believe in God anymore. They grieve against Him. They're unhappy with the Lord. They think, you know, they think Egypt is still better than before. They've forgotten all the suffering they had, all the beatings and all the, the hard labor they have. And they limited the Holy One of Israel. You see how they limited Him? God has bigger plans. God has plans to bring them into promised land. But now they are limiting Him. And I don't want to limit God too. Neither would you want to limit Him. Would you? So don't limit Him. You are saved by grace. That finished work, God's part. Through faith. Now you're appropriating faith to what God has done by grace. Do not limit him. That's why you read in the, the parables where Jesus taught, parable of the seed. Some harvest 30%, some 60, some 100. Why is there so, such a disparity of 30 and 100? Because there are people who limit him. Right? 30% of blessing really took up lah, you know. Because you're limiting him. Yes, God's plan for you is hundred percent. You see how they limited the Holy One. So stop limiting him. Alright. Stop limiting him. Believe in the finished work. Use your faith as positive response to what God has done on the cross. So every time when you find yourself that you don't have that, that, that anchor or that substance where you want to appropriate your faith, you remember the finished work. It's done. It's done on the cross. You just have to remember. That is why Jesus in the Last Supper, He said, do this in remembrance of me. Do what? In fact, when they were having the, the Holy Communion at the Last Supper, they don't even realize what they're doing. They just drink and eat only. Because Jesus is about to die on the cross, which hasn't happened yet. They still didn't believe that Jesus is going to die on the cross. They couldn't comprehend. Because Jesus was, just, was a hero among them. He's a leader. Every time they... The Pharisees or the, the or whoever want to come and uh, 
arrest him or capture him, Jesus would just slip away. He would just disappear somehow. He would just slip away and they would have stoned him. They couldn't. He just slip away. He would just somehow disappear. So they could not understand. They have seen all the miracles. They've seen how people could not arrest him or stone him. The crowds, they have seen it. They cannot understand in their mind that their carnal mind that Jesus is going to be arrested and die and weep. His face will be marred, his body will have stripes and scourging. And do this in remembrance of him. So when you do that, that is your substance, the emblem of the body of Christ for your healing and the wine is the blood of Jesus that leads you to righteousness that you are the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ you must know your righteous position right everyone say I'm righteous through Jesus Christ on your own you are not righteous it's through Jesus Christ that's why you're righteous on your own you can't be a conqueror it's through Jesus Christ that's why you are a conqueror On your own, you can't be strengthened. You can't be strong. It's through Jesus Christ. That's right. You are strengthened and strong. Amen. Shall we all rise? Musician, come to the stage.